Well, good morning. Uh, sorry we had to go with plan B and so we're a little late, but we are excited to worship together this morning. As I look outside from my little office in Nenzel, the snow is starting to stick to the ground and it's accumulating. And so I'm thankful that we can all be safe. We can all be at home and uh, I'm looking forward to this worship time. So if you would join me, let's pray. And then we're going to just uh, go into um, some songs and some scripture and the message. So let's pray. Lord God, we just come before you this morning. We know that you are in charge of everything. Um, Lord, I'm excited about this opportunity to worship together. Even though it's not ideal and it's not what I was hoping for this Sunday, I'll, I also thank you just for the gift of technology that a year ago, as COVID kind of broke loose, we learned a lot about how to connect with each other and make it work. And so we just pray that you would make it work this morning. We pray that as we gather in your name that our focus would be off of the stuff in our lives off of the weather off of our phones and just onto you and your goodness lord connect our heart with yours we just want to offer up this time as a a sacrifice of praise to you thank you so much that we can celebrate jesus wherever we are and that through technology we can do it together so we just give this time to you in jesus name amen well, this morning I did have a couple of announcements to quickly go through, and I'm not going to be able to put them on the screen for you, but I uh, do want to just click through them really quick and, and um, on my computer, and I'll just kind of update you on a couple of things this morning. Uh, first of all, there's a ladies' conference coming up next Saturday, and ladies, if you'd like to be a part of it, it's up in Bone Steel, South Dakota, and it's um, going to be put on by Overflow Ministries Women's Conference 2021. Um, chaos, Christ has an obvious solution, Romans 15, 13. So I love that verse and I love that acronym. So keep that in mind, ladies. Um, looks like some great speakers. Also keep in mind 24-7 prayer. If you'd like to sign up, talk to Janet or Nicole, if God is stirring your heart for that. Um, we will, Lord willing, have Kids Club and Youth Group this Wednesday. Also next Sunday, we're hoping to finish up Adult Sunday School at Cutcomb at 8 o'clock in the morning. And then we'll do that for four weeks um, in Cody. So keep that in mind. Tim will be leading that. Um, that'll be at 8 Mountain Time to 8.30. So junior high youth group this week, Wednesday. High school youth group will be after track around 6.30 Mountain Time at the Parkers, Pizza and Oreos. So keep that in mind. And then if you'd like to be a part of a Discovery Bible study, let me know. Ladies Bible study will be canceled for today. Um, typically meeting after church at 12.30. So ladies, Discovery Bible Study, keep that in mind for next Sunday. Hopefully, Lord willing, the weather will be a lot better at 12.30 Mountain Time. And then next Sunday, prayer gathering, March 21st, 6.30 Mountain Time. Um, how it goes with prayer is how it goes with our church, with the flock. And so keep that um, also on your schedule, please, and add that. All right, I think at this point, um, we're just going to try to do a quick worship song as, as a family. So Abby and Denna, if you'd come up, and uh, we're going to worship the Lord with a song entitled, The Goodness of God. I wish you could sing with us, but we will, we will sing through it and join us at home if you want. Yeah. 
sometimes it does feel like fire and sometimes uh, snow and and whatever he brings but we are so thankful and we're going to invite the rest of the family up minus um, our son and so Daniel we just want to all tell you Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Daniel. Daniel. Hey, we love you. Everybody else that might have a birthday, too, we just want to wish you a happy Mark birthday Birchfield greetings. Has Mark Birchfield, happy birthday to you. Cheryl Novin, Sadie Addison, there's quite a few, yeah. All right, so sounds good. Thanks, guys. We're going to transition and look at God's Word, and I'm excited. Uh, Miriam's going to stay up, grab her Bible here, and we're going to read from Matthew 27. It is um, the Lenten season. It is the season leading up to our celebration of Christ, His death burial and resurrection on Easter Sunday. And by the way, April 4th, Easter Sunday, we are going to be out at um, Steer Creek Campground outside for Easter Sunday, weather permitting. If it doesn't permit, we will be at Cutcomb School for a celebration together. Um, and so in keeping with that, um, Miriam's going to read a passage for us from Matthew 27, 45 to 54. And so, uh, Miriam, if you'd go ahead and read out loud, loudly for us, and uh, let's worship the Lord. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land, until the ninth hour, the loud saying, oh, Eli, Eli, lemma scabelli, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, the man is calling Elijah, and one of them at once ran and took a sponge filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yield up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were, right, were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the, when the centration and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. All right, thanks, Miriam. Appreciate that. We are going to look at 1 John chapter 5, but that passage is going to really tie into what we want to look at this morning, and I am really feeling a, a burden from the Lord that this passage is very important for us this morning from 1 John 5, beginning in verse 6, and we're going to look at verses 6 to 12, and this morning we want to look at God's testimony and how that can become our testimony, receiving God's testimony as our own. I can't see you this morning, thankfully. Um, you can see me, and I just pray that, that you would pray for me as I share God's word in this in this circumstance, that uh, God would just really be able to speak to all of our hearts this morning. And so if, if you would bow with me, let's pray again, and let's take a look at God's word. Lord, I thank you so much that you have given us your word, and I thank you for what Miriam could read for us, that your um, God, your son, came to this world, um, was willing to be placed upon a cross, was willing to take our punishment and die there, and that in the midst of all that, God, you showed and put on display um, that this was a supernatural event, that this wasn't just another man dying on a cross, but that this had ramifications for eternity, that this was our sins being placed upon your son, and that we were watching upon that cross. Those who were there were watching the rejection that we should have felt, that we should feel for eternity that was placed upon your Son, God, Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you'd stir our hearts this morning with your testimony, that it could be truly become ours, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would just be pleasing God in your sight. You're our rock and you're our redeemer. And I just pray for those that are calving this morning, that you would watch over them, that you'd keep everyone safe. We just pray that those baby calves would stay alive, that moms and, and babies would be able to just um, stay linked together, that you, God, would just provide for the livelihood across the sand hills of ranchers and farmers going through all of this right now. Um, we just ask you to intervene. We ask you to oversee. We ask you to be Lord of our lives, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, lately, Den and I have uh, just had the opportunity um, to watch a couple of Hallmark mystery movies, and 
one of the things that I've noticed throughout these movies is that over and over the detectives, as they interview potential witnesses um, and maybe potential um, uh, people who are guilty, trying to find that out, they often ask if there's anyone who can verify where they were at the time of the crime. And if that um, testimony, if that can be verified, like say someone was at a gas station instead of at the library or something when this thing happened, then it's, it's obvious and it's clear that this person is not guilty. And so if, if the testimony of multiple witnesses matches and comes together, it verifies and it makes it believable, it's credible. In 1 John 5, 6 through 12, the Apostle John zeroes in on three specific witnesses that God uses in his testimony about his son Jesus. And so we want to investigate those this morning, and we want to see that God's testimony about his son is credible. So if you would join me in 1 John 5, verse 6, this is he, speaking of Jesus, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. These are really powerful verses. And I want us to see, first of all, that God's testimony did not stop at the cross. Now, for a lot of us, we would say, yes, we know that, we get that. But we want to understand that a little bit more clear. God's testimony didn't stop at the cross. So in the Old Testament, credibility of a witness had, or a testimony had to be established. Uh, a conviction for like a murder had to be established on the basis of two or three witnesses. And here, John is saying, you know what? God's given us three witnesses that we need to focus on this morning that verify who Jesus is. Why is that important? Because we don't overcome the world. We don't have salvation. We don't have eternal life unless we believe that Jesus is who God the Father says he is. And so we have these three witnesses, the water, the blood, and the spirit. Now as I was studying this, I have to be honest, I was, I was confused because it's not immediately obvious what water and blood are referring to. The Spirit is obviously referring to the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And so I needed to ask this question, and as I studied, this question came up. When did God, specifically during the life and ministry of Jesus, when did God specifically speak to who his son was. And the thing that came forward was the baptism and the crucifixion of Jesus. And so most Bible scholars believe that, that the water here refers to when Jesus was baptized, God spoke about his son. And also when Jesus was on that cross, when he was dying, when he was being crucified, God the Father once again spoke strongly about the identity of his son. And so, uh, kind of a complimentary passage this morning is in Matthew chapter 3. And if you want to turn there, I invite you to. But it's an account of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus, and he felt very inferior to Jesus, but he was preparing the way for Jesus, for the Messiah. He was a front runner, and the way that he prepared people was he, he encouraged people to repent of their sins. Now, I want you to picture the Snake River south of Merriman. It's a great place to put in a canoe or a kayak and go down the river. It's a place where the river's not too, uh, not too strong, not too wide. It's easy access. And I want you to picture that that's, that's a little bit like the Jordan River. A pretty remote location, uh, but a place where people can gather, people can get in the water, and people can be baptized there. And so John the Baptizer, John the Baptist, had gathered people to come and hear him. You see... 
Israelites thought that they, because they were born Israelites, because they kept a lot of rituals, because they knew a lot of scripture, that they were in with God. But the reality was is that their hearts were far from God. And so as John the Baptist preached and, and he proclaimed, and this guy would courageously call out hypocrisy, people began to be convicted in their hearts. They began to realize that their hearts weren't really surrendered to God. And all their lives they'd heard this message that they had to do more for God. And maybe you've heard that message too. You've got to go through the motions. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to be in church. You've got to be praying. You've got to be giving, whatever it is. In all their lives, they'd heard that message. And now they were hearing this message that God, what God wanted from them is simply for them to turn to him in humble brokenness. And he would do the rest. Did you get that? What God wants from us is humble brokenness to turn to him and he's going to do the rest. And so God began to convict hearts and people began confessing their sins and getting right with God and revival started breaking out. And because of that, guess who showed up? The religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were kind of like polar opposites on the religious spectrum. The Pharisees were the guys who kept the ritual, they kept the rules, they were very tied to the scriptures, but it was in a legalistic, I have to do this for God and then he'll approve of me. The Sadducees were the guys who said, you know what, miracles in the Old Testament, they're not real. Uh, what we're about is human reason. What we're about is um, just pretty much being high up in society. And so the Sadducees were kind of like the liberal mindset today. God's word is there, but it, we can't really trust it to be a supernatural declaration from God. But these guys showed up. And they're saying to John, we want to be baptized too. And John says, wait a minute, you guys are a brood of vipers. You guys are there to poison people, to dissuade people. But then Jesus comes along. And we pick it up in Matthew 3, 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But, John, but Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And this, then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So at the baptism of Jesus, God clearly spoke. God gave a testimony. God gave a witness. And in the form of a dove, which wasn't an actual bird, but there was this spiritual manifestation of God the Spirit coming to rest upon Jesus and this declaration that this was the Son of God. Fast forward with me then to the crucifixion. If you turn with me back to 1 John 5, John says that God declares Jesus Christ to be his son, not by water only, but by water and the blood. So in other words, John is giving special emphasis to the crucifixion, the time when Jesus shed his blood. Why would John have to say it wasn't just the baptism, it was also his crucifixion? You and I would probably say, well, obviously it's a declaration of God at the crucifixion. But there were people in John's day called Gnostics. And the Gnostics believed that at the baptism of Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of the Son of God, came to rest upon this human, human man, Jesus. But that before Jesus was crucified, that Spirit left him, and it was simply a man dying on a cross. Well, you see, that changes everything. If Jesus was only a man, let's say he was a perfect man. And he died on the cross. He could only have died for one other person. He could only have given his life for one other. If he was God, then he could give his life for the sins of the entire world. And so the Gnostics were undermining the testimony of God. The testimony that said, this is my son. This is God, the son who is giving his life. And so John wants us to know that God didn't just speak at the baptism. God also spoke at the crucifixion. And we say, well, how, how did God speak when Jesus shed his blood? 
Well, there's a couple things that stick out to me from Matthew 27 that Miriam read for us. If you notice in verse 45, darkness fell upon the land for about three hours. That wasn't normal. That was supernatural. That was God speaking. You'll also notice that there was a declaration of Jesus on the cross that the Father had forsaken him. Verse 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt a disconnect, and that was another way of God and the Son, Father and Son, testifying to the fact that something was happening that was redemptive. Then in verse 51, we see that there was a tearing of the veil in the temple from top to bottom. God was doing away with the old law, the old covenant. The new covenant was coming in place. God was speaking. He was declaring that the sacrifices within the temple were no longer needed. And now believers had access to the holy of holies, the presence of God. God was speaking at the crucifixion. Then we also read in Matthew 27, and I'm going to turn there again. We see in Matthew 27, verse 51, that there was the earth shaking. There was an earthquake. There was rocks split and there was tombs being opened. Matthew 27 verse 51. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Wow, can you imagine? So these saints, these dear believers, all of a sudden, they're back to life. And they're testifying that something amazing is happening. Did God speak at the crucifixion, at the resurrection? Absolutely he did. He declared that this wasn't just a man dying on the cross. This was the very Son of God. And so that was God's testimony. But God's testimony can become our own. You see, God doesn't just want his testimony to be out there, to just be on the pages of Scripture. He wants his testimony to be within our hearts. And that's where we come to verse 9 of 1 John 5. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God, that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. I want you to know this morning, there's going to be challenges to God's testimony. There's going to be challenges just like those Gnostics who are going to challenge God's testimony with human ideas. Human reasoning that says things like Jesus was just another great religious person, religious individual. There's going to be challenges to that reality. That Jesus was God's son taking your place and my place on the cross. And that's why John said, you know what? You're going to be tempted to receive the testimony of men over the testimony of God. But we need to understand this morning that the testimony of God is greater. God did a miracle at the baptism of Jesus to declare his son. To have this, the heavens peeled open and probably light shining down. And then this presence of the Holy Spirit resting on Jesus and this voice calling out, This is my beloved Son. I'm pleased with Him. To have the earth shaken at the crucifixion. To have the tombs split open. The rocks and the darkness. And this realization that God's wrath was being poured out upon His Son. We have a testimony, though, that comes into our life when we, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And that's the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Look again at verse 10. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. You see, that's the presence of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives that verifies our relationship with the living God. And so I, what I want us to also see this morning, the third thing, and this is the final thing this morning. Believing God's testimony is the only way to receive what matters most. You see, maybe for you, you can accept the baptism testimony of God. Maybe you can accept the crucifixion testimony of God, but you haven't received the spirit testimony. And without that third witness in your life, you don't have a relationship 
You don't have salvation. You don't have eternal life. Look with me at verse 11. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So we don't have a connection. We don't have a relationship with God. We don't have eternal life with God unless we receive the testimony of God's Spirit into our hearts that we are accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We have to receive this testimony as our own. I love this quote from Tony Evans on, on the pursuit of godliness. Tony Evans says this, One of the things that keeps us from godliness is that we keep debating God. You can't be disagreeing with the character... Excuse me, let me start that over. You can't be disagreeing with the person you are trying to be like. Godliness is a lifestyle that is consistently reflecting the character of God. He goes on to say, You've got to decide what God says is right. How I feel about it, what my friends say about it, how I was raised in it, is all wrong when it disagrees with God. Man, this morning you realize that, you know what, there's some rebellion in our hearts. There's some resisting of the work of God's Spirit in our lives that we wanted to believe it in our heads, but we haven't wanted to believe it in our hearts. We haven't wanted to surrender to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we've been holding back on the Holy Spirit, but we've been trying to live the right life. We've been like the Pharisees. We've been trying to do the good life. We've been trying to go through the ritual. We've been trying to somehow live out God's Word, but we realize we can't do it. We can't do it unless... We, just stop, we decide to stop debating God. I love how Dr. Evans puts that. Instead of debating God, we decide to agree with God. We decide to agree with God in a couple different ways. First of all, we decide to believe that we need a Savior. That we're broken people. That in humility, we say, God, I need your mercy and grace. God, I have messed up. I have fallen so far short of who you are and what you want from me. I've been resisting you. I've been denying you. Secondly, we come to believe that Jesus is that Savior that God declares him to be. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one who took my punishment. And then thirdly, we come to this place where we give our heart to him and we ask that his spirit transform our life. I heard a story years ago, and I looked it up again uh, yesterday, and, and you may have heard it before. But it illustrates the reality of the fact that we need Jesus Christ to have eternal life. And there was a famous art collector who collected rare pieces from all over the world. And his son got into it with him, and so together they, they searched the world for these rare pieces from these amazing artists. And they would put these canvases in their home and... And um, the father was so proud of the son and his love for art that they shared together. Well, eventually in this country where they lived, war broke out and the son had to go off to war. And one day there was a sad letter that came in the mail that his son had died trying to carry a fellow soldier to a medic for help. And so the, the father was heartbroken well, it was Christmas Day, as the story is told, and there was a knock on this art collector's door. And he opens the door, and there's a soldier with a package in his arms. And he extends his hand, and he says, I was the soldier that your son was carrying to the medic, and I survived, and he died, and I'm an artist. And I know your son loved art, and I know you loved art, and I loved getting to know your son, and I made this portrait. I painted this portrait of your son, and so we unwrapped it, and here was this portrait. It wasn't like high-end art, but it had an, a remarkable reality of who the son was. It captured the son, and the father loved the painting. Well, eventually the, the father died, and there's going to be this auction, and people gather from all over, and they're excited to bid on these rare pieces of art. And to their surprise, the auctioneer says, the first piece we're going to auction off is this portrait of the sun. And everyone kind of laughs and chuckles, like, let's get it out of the way. So the bidding starts, and the auctioneer says, all right, who, who will give me 100 bucks? Let's start the bidding at $100. Who will give me $100 for this painting? 
No one bends. Everyone's waiting for the good stuff. Finally, someone in the crowds, who was a family friend, said, I have good memories of the father and the son. I'll bid $100. So the auctioneer says, we have $100. Who will bid next? Do we have any other bids? And it's silent. So he says, going once, going twice. And he bangs the gavel and he says, sold for $100. And now everyone's excited because now they can get on to the real bidding. And the auctioneer says, well, ladies and gentlemen, according to the will, the auction is now closed. Because the request of this art collector, the request of the owner, was that whoever bought the portrait of the son got everything else. Now, I can't tell you for sure if that story is true or not. But what I can tell you is that if we have the Son, we have eternal life. If we have Jesus, we have everything else that we need in this world. And we can be going after the other stuff, but if we miss Jesus, the Bible says that in the end, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And so this morning, I want to plead with you to make sure that you have Jesus. Because you see, when I was in high school, as a young man, a high schooler, my grandmother Marie was passing away. She was dying of cancer. And our family went to see her. And you know, it's an awkward time. There she is. And, and um, what do you say? But I'd been memorizing some of these very verses from 1 John 5. And so I came up to her. And I quoted these verses. This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Then I went on to verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. My grandmother Marie, she knew that she had the Son. And I saw a peace and a joy come over her. And it wasn't long after that she passed away. But I can tell you from firsthand experience that when we believe God's testimony about what he said at Christ's baptism, when we believe God's testimony about what he said at Christ's crucifixion, and when we allow that testimony to be verified through the Spirit coming to dwell inside of us because we've asked to be forgiven, because we have believed that Jesus was God's Son who came and died in our place, that there's a peace and a joy and an assurance that those three witnesses agree. And that those three witnesses lead us to affirm that God is not lying. That God is telling the truth. You see, John wrote, Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. So if we choose not to trust Christ, then we are saying, we don't believe God. God, you're a liar. God, your word isn't right. Your word isn't real. I want you to know this morning that God's word can be proven true. God's testimony can be proven true in your life when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you step out in faith, and I'd just like to invite you right now, if you have not received Jesus, and as that snow is swirling that God can make your heart white as snow. And you can simply cry out to God and you can simply say, Lord Jesus, I believe the testimony that you came in my place. You came and died in my place. You lived a perfect life in my place. You didn't quit being God on the cross, but you died for my sins and you offered me a new life that I couldn't, earn and I don't deserve. And Jesus, right now, I'm asking you to be my Lord and Savior. I'm asking you to make me new. I'm asking you to take me in a new direction. Jesus, from now on, I'm living my life for you and through you. God, I just thank you for the wonderful, awesome, 
privilege it is to see your testimony line up in our lives and that we can receive your testimony as our own and then we can share it and we can declare it to those around us that we love and that we care about. So Lord, I pray that we would take your testimony and we would share it, that first we would internalize it and then we would proclaim it from our hearts and not just from our minds, but from our hearts, knowing who you are. Thank you for the eternal life that you give us, Jesus. Thank you that we can live forever in heaven with you, that that relationship starts the moment we say yes to you, and it carries on for all of eternity. We thank you for the hope of the gospel that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for the opportunity to share this morning. Next week, we're going to look at more of that assurance as we wrap up 1 John. And I think it's great to lead us closer to Easter. So please join us next week. Hopefully, we'll be back in the church and things will be a little bit more um, streamlined. But thanks a lot for being a part of things. Have a great day and um, just God bless and keep us all safe. Take care.